Welcome to A Pint with Shawnee B. Coming to you today from Williamsburg in Brooklyn at the studio of a good friend of mine, uh, an excellent globally renowned photographer, commercial, artistic, and also recently getting into film direction, Simon Harsant. How you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Just back Thank from you. Sydney. Just back from Sydney, yeah, like a week ago, so I still... Kind of dealing with a little bit of jet lag, actually, but there you go. We've known each other, I guess, about seven or eight years. I think I got introduced to you when I first came here. Yeah, I think so, yeah. We met up one night in that old bar that's on Mulberry Street, the Australian one that you used to frequent. What was that called? Yeah, Eight Mile Creek. Eight Mile Creek, which is no longer. Which is, yeah, no, it was gone, disappeared. And you've recently just opened a restaurant here. Uh, Yeah, well, partnered up with a really sort of close old friend of mine and what's the name of the restaurant the restaurant is Les Enfants de Bohème yeah very nice English man with a steak in a French restaurant in New York City is quite bizarre that's very cool yeah (laughs) Um, you're from England yeah I was born in a place called Aston Clinton in Buckinghamshire right. um, and I lived there till I was about six and moved to a town just outside of there called Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire you know one of those sort of satellite towns just outside of London so I grew up there from the age of six and then moved to London when I was I think probably about 18 I think and a very creative then. father yeah yeah I grew up um, my, my father's a poet and quite a well renowned poet in England yeah, recently earlier this year won the T.S. Eliot Prize what's his name David Harson. David yeah. Harson. Yeah. Yeah, what sort of poetry does he write uh, dark <laughs> <laughs> very dark a bit like my photography really Yes, but it was kind of, it was a a very strange upbringing because I grew up in a very working class neighbourhood and, you know, we were very, very poor actually, like when I, when the first house I lived in, or the house I was actually born in, um, was literally a two up, two down with an outside bathroom and no hot running water and we had a tin bath that used to come in from outside, which my mum used to fill with hot water uh, from her sort of twin tub washing machine and my sister had had first bath and then she'd top up the water with pots off the stove and and then I'd get in and have second bath and then my parents would have third bath which is pretty much how my brother was born I think <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird it sounds a little bit like a Monty Python sketch as well you know yeah but yeah, it was it was a very. I mean, was your I mean, father you don't writing really about the struggle of working class or was he back no, then? Or was he not really? No, I mean he's. I don't know. It's very difficult to describe his poetry. I mean it. Yeah, like I say, it's dark. It's very, very dark. Yeah, I don't know. I Was guess. he a happy guy? Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. Yeah, yeah. very. Right. Yeah, very. So is it yeah. weird? I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's like any artist. I mean, we're all sort of very completely self-absorbed. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, he wasn't. He wasn't the sort of dad that would take you out and play football with you and and you know, sort of kind of do activities like that but you know as, as I've got older he's you know an incredible father to have around and inspiration and yeah. that sort of stuff so and, and was we, he was he successful later in life rather than earlier was he struggling yeah or? no I mean he was I mean he was he's always been very well regarded even since his his first published book which was called A Violent Country and was you know sort of around a group of artists at that time in London or a group of poets around that time in London who I guess uh, were the core of English poetry, all based around a guy called Ian Hamilton. So, so were you, were you, when you were growing up, were you very conscious of his artistic merit and, and, and credentials? Yeah, yeah, I was. And and it's funny because I'm actually, I'm dyslexic, so which I didn't find out until a lot, lot later in life. Right. You know, you feel quite intimidated, I guess. and I, and Given that he's a writer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I just I just think that you know, the level of conversation is very different to the sort of type of conversation you, know, you would have with a normal father, I guess. So, what was, your, was your mother creative? Yeah, she is. I mean, she's very, very well read, but, you know, she became the housewife, really. Yeah. Um, and then later on, went on to work with, as a teacher's assistant with, you know, Down syndrome children and stuff like that. Very much a caring. The saint. Yeah, she, yeah. yeah. How young were you when you worked out? You were going to go down a similar route. Probably about eleven. I used to. It's funny because when when we moved to Aylesbury, my f- that front room was sort of became virtually my dad's study, and the whole room was just lined with books. So I used to my the way I'd spend time with my father is I'd go and sit in his study with him while he was typing right. or he was writing. So he'd be writing poems, and I was allowed to be in the room, but I wasn't 
allowed to talk to him. <laughs> That's very <laughs> yeah, it was provocative. Kind of, I can see that like a very English children shall be seen and not heard. Yeah, you know? I mean, it, it kind of, it kind of was, but it kind of wasn't. I mean, it was also it was just like you know, you can be in the room with me, but you know, I'm you have to understand I'm working. Yes. And I need to concentrate. Yes. Yeah. And the funny thing is that you know, I would think that when he stopped typing. You could talk. That was when I could talk to him, but obviously that's when he's composing his thoughts. Yeah. So, and so I used to sort of kind of sit in the room, and we had and we had so many books on sort of Rembrandt, Gauguin, and I th- I think it was then I got the ability to be in the presence of someone else without having to talk too much. It's weird. I have that with my son as well. You know, sometimes we'll just be able to be in the same room and not talk to each other, but just be perfectly comfortable. Present. Yeah. with just the fact that you've, there's a warm body in the room yeah. you know what I mean? yeah. but it was I mean basically what happened was I was um, it was like one of those sort of horrible rainy days and I was off school you know I was bored out of my mind and, and you know dad was like you know, go read a book or go do a painting or something so so I went upstairs and I did this painting and the painting was of the Titanic hitting an iceberg and I don't know why I chose to paint that mm. I think maybe we were studying at a school or something and you know, I took it down to and showed my father, and you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, as children, you're constantly seeking approval of your parents yeah. and stuff, and you know, or I was anyway with my father, and you know, he loved it, and he was like, "Wow, this is great!" You know, my son's going to be an artist. Brilliant. <laughs> so, and so he kind of whisked me off to the to the paint store and brought me what paints he could afford, and then introduced me to an artist who lived around the corner who eventually taught me how to stretch canvases and do all that sort wow. of stuff, and I started painting. So that was probably sort of kind of 11 years yeah. old and then photography was an option at school you know you get to I think mm. it's like 13 or whatever you get to you have to select your subjects that you're going to take your GSEs or CSE mm. or whatever they were called I can't even remember now O-levels um, and A-levels O-levels and yeah. A-levels yeah that's right the reason I actually took it was because all my mates were taking photography and I just right. thought yeah this is the lesson it's like it's one of those it's, that sounds easy yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah so I was like I don't have to work too hard and you know, and also, like, I mean, like I say, I mean, I went through the whole of my school. I went to a sort of really crappy, com- comprehensive school in Aylesbury where, you know, teachers really just turned up for work. They, they, they weren't really care. interested and, in, you know, kids, it was just about, it was almost like prison. It was about doing yeah. your time. Was so, it a rough school? Um, not really. I mean, I mean, rough in the sense that, well, yeah, I guess we there used to be sort of organised fights between the other schools <laughs> in the area. Yeah, so, yeah so it, it wasn't rough, it yeah. was it wasn't necessarily rough, but it was just I don't know. Well, so were you always it getting like, A's in art and stuff like that? Like, was that your? Oh, I never got an A in anything. Right. Actually, it's funny. I was just in London. My mum's my mum's was thinking about selling a house. She's not, which I grew up in, but she's not anymore. But so she had this massive clear out, and she gave me this my old school report. She kept all my school reports. Brilliant. And they were basically like, you know, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> He's, you know, he needs to... I think there's a great line from one, which is, you know, Simon thinks that he doesn't need the help of the teachers. I think he's, he has to realise that he's wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he'll never come to anything. You know, it was really, like really, really shitty school reports. I mean, basically, I think I was, I was just a bit destructive in classrooms. And, you know, I don't know what I know now, probably would have changed that. But. What did you do when you left then? Well, when I left school, actually, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I knew that, I mean, I love photography I was and drama, and I used to do all the lighting for the school plays and yeah. stuff like that, and, you know, art, obviously. And, and the reason why I took, the other, one of the other reasons why I took photography as an option is because I actually thought it would be really good to take pictures and then paint from pictures. Because, mm-hmm. you know, at the time I was... You know, how I was honing my skills as a painter was I'd basically sort of kind of, you know, look through books like Rembrandt and Van Gogh and and but and then I'd try and replicate that. You yeah. Know? I, mean, I was a twelve year old kid, thirteen year old kid, so I thought photography would be a really good idea in the sense that I could photograph something and then paint from that photograph because yeah. I really needed to take time to process that. And then I and then really once I discovered photography it was like one of those light bulb moments really I mean I just loved it so much and you know I used to build a dark room in my bedroom so I'd pick up blankets from the bed really? <laughs> over the window and I'd convert my bedroom into a dark room which was a great way to sneak girls in as well when I was younger <laughs> <laughs> don't come in <laughs> yeah exactly my mum would never ever open the door if she thought yeah. I was printing you know, so I'd have girlfriends drop over and see me but, yeah so not a lot of printing got done but yeah, so then yeah, so then anyway, after school, I really didn't know what I was going to do. But Dad was, you know, he, 
you know, he sort of said, you know, do you want to do photography? And I'd never really even considered the fact that you could. I was, you could do it. I was actually keen to do what all my mates did, which was go work in the local hearing aid factory and buy myself a motorbike. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sort of work it out from there. I, Is the hearing aid factory still there? No, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, probably not. So, yeah, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't even know that that was a, that was a viable option for me. But at the time, Dad was living in London. Him and my mother had separated. Um, and he knew a woman who worked at an advertising agency and she, he introduced me to a photographer called Andrew Moran, phenomenal photographer. And so I went and did a little bit of work experience with him and then that, I sort of kind of thought, yeah, maybe this is an option. So I applied to Watford College and I went to Watford College and did a city and guilds in photography there. So, so yeah, were, so, were you like, ooh, look at the fancy pants going to college? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mates? kind of. I mean, it was tough though because I was living in Aylesbury, and so I'd have to get the bus to Watford every day. That was like two hours there, two hours back every day on the bus. Right. Yeah. It was, Did you that, love it though? Like, was it good? Yeah. Again, I don't think I, I. I'm not really good with being told what to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it was probably just the wrong course for me, to be honest. It was a very technical course. It was a city and girls course. I think, in hindsight, I probably would have been better with a, a you know, more arts-based course. And, mm. You know, I mean, was I it think a one-year course. It was a two-year course, and I left halfway through my second year. I just sort of kind of got to a stage where actually I met a, a photographer. Uh, well, Andrew, the guy that I'd, I'd met previously, I'd started working with him and the guy that he was sharing a studio with offered me a full-time job. Ah, so okay. I went and saw my tutors and said, you know, I've got a job doing what I, I want to do once I leave college anyway. So, you know, I might as well just do it, do that. And that and was an apprenticeship college. running around. Yeah. It was just being an assistant, you yeah. know, dog's body sweeping the mm. floor. Okay. So now you have a job and then how do you break out? Cause I've always wondered this when you, when I, when I do shoots or when I'm on, on set, it's like you, you see all these people who are helping. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how they get to become, I mean, it's kind of funny, really, like everything, I mean, I guess everything happens for a reason, but the reality for me was that I never actually made that decision. It just sort of kind of was something that occurred. What happened was I assisted in London for a few years and some fantastic photographers and brilliant mentors. I don't know if anyone has a full-time assistant anymore, but, you know, at the time, full-time assisting was just the way it was and you got paid peanuts and mm. you know I think I was on like 50 quid a week and my rent was 25 and yeah. you know my train pass was 10 and yeah. you know the, the rest of it was beer money you know yeah. and then when I needed to build, play the bills I'd ring dad <laughs> <laughs> raise another yeah, ball dad exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah so what, what actually happened was I, I I just kind of got a bit fed up with England and I decided to go on a working holiday to Australia and I, again like it was just one of those things it was just a women of prayer and, and the way that I tend to make things happen is I just tell people I'm going to do it so you have to you do have it because yeah. <laughs> I actually look like an idiot so I was like well, I'm going to Australia and I was like I didn't have <laughs> and so yeah I just got a working holiday visa for Australia and I got to Australia and I was just really I was just going to assist and just sort of kind of wanted to see a bit of the country and I met this photographer a guy called Billy Wrench, who's an expat English photographer, lovely guy. And I showed him my portfolio. He just looked at it and he said, you know, he said, mate, he said, you know, you should just find a shared studio and start shooting. Yeah. You know, I didn't have any gear with me. I mean, I just had, you know, I think it was like a Pentax and a Canon and that was pretty much it. Just, I needed to find a scenario where I could share a studio and use the gear. And so I got into the shared sh- studio with this other photographer who sort of kind of had other people working out and they did a percentage deal where right. they took a certain amount of your fee for being able to work out in the studio. You know, that was really good actually because, he, you know, he introduced me to a lot of people out there and, you know, there was a lot of expat art directors at the time. And I, I guess in a, in a way as well, I was just very lucky. I, mean, I, was, I was 20, I guess I was 21, nearly 22. You know, because I come from England, it wasn't you know, like it is now. It's like you know, trends just sweep the world straight away. But you know, I think English it photography take months was, for stuff to get out. Yeah, there, you know? yeah. There was a very different scene going on in London. It was you know a lot of soft focus, and which I'm very good at getting things out of focus. <laughs> so am I. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just made it my my uh, my look. And I, I mean, I did get to a stage after the first six months. I remember I I was living at the studio 
I was kind of sneaking back. I didn't have any money or to kind of run out of money. I'd done a few jobs, but I was waiting for, you know, advertising, you always waiting for the money yeah. to come in, you know. It's 90 60 days. 90 days, it was ridiculous. And I remember one weekend I had $5 to my name, that was it. Wow. And the studio was up in St. Leonard's. Where the, the time was, you know, there was yeah. nothing around there on the weekend. Yeah. And I went down and I bought enough food to make two stir fries. I thought that would get me through the weekend and, you know, someone will be in on the weekend, on Monday, and I can borrow a tenner off them. Do you sleep in the studio? Yeah, so I yeah, sneak back in and sleep at the studio because wow. I had nowhere to go. I remember I burnt the first lot of stir fry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are oh, you kidding? But there was a slab of beer in the fridge. Right. So I was just like, there's only one thing for it, isn't it? Just get horrendously drunk. Yeah. <laughs> so... So I got smashed and I called my father and I was just, you know, I said, oh, look, you know, I think I'm going to come back. And I was really low, actually. I was quite lonely at the time as well. And I was like, I was kind of like, what the fuck have I done? Mm. You know, I've left my life in England and you know, mm. in a strange country. And, and he just basically sort of said, look, you know, just hang in, you know, just see how you go. And, and then the next week I got this huge job coming in for the launch of the four-wheel steering Honda Prelude. Um, this would have been a big pay rate, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me at the time, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was you know it was more money than I'd seen since ever, really. Yeah. And yeah, and that was really sort of kind of what turned everything around for me. And then I, I extended my visa for another six months and stayed till the the December of that year and went back to England. A for, photographer. Uh, yeah, 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 pretty much. And that was the that was the eighty eight. So that was the bicentenary year for mm. Australia. And I got back and I was staying at my dad's apartment and... Was he proud of you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, he's, I mean, you know, you know, kids, I mean, it's like, you know, I say to my son, you could be a serial killer and I could still never stop loving you. Yeah. I'd be disappointed. <laughs> you don't have to kill too many. Yeah, exactly. You don't have the ability not to love your children, I don't think. Well, I don't know, I guess some people do, but... So, yeah, I got back there and, you know, I was watching all this stuff, like Alan Wicker was doing a special on, mm. you know, Australia and I sit there in my dad's apartment looking out the window with the rain and the low cloud cover and <laughs> watching all these pictures of Sydney and I just went, you know what, I'm going to apply for residency and and I uh, got that pretty quickly and so by March of 88 I was back there as a full-time permanent resident and never really looked back, that's the last time, last time I lived in England and then in 1988, oh no hang on, 1989 I branched out and went into my own studio scenario when yeah. did you start bringing the idea of your artistic photography back into into because as i when i would have known you i would have thought of you much more as a sort of an artistic photographer yeah i was always testing and i was always shooting sort of personal work but for me i always sort of came from the premise that the work had to be beautiful regardless of whether it was commercial work or personal work or whatever you know, and that, I guess that's what I became known for as well. It was beautifully crafted work, and I, and it was more actually a, tran, a transition from being a still life photographer to being a people photographer. Really, mm. I think that you know it was it was funny because I was in this you know one of the most beautiful cities in the world, but stuck in a studio from you know sort of ten o'clock in the morning till yeah. midnight yeah. most nights while it was sweltering hot outside and, and beautiful to photograph in Sydney isn't yeah, it yeah and you know but my whole life was in my studio yeah. <laughs> it was kind of yeah. like you know these indoors dark, yeah indoors yeah. these darkened rooms and I I guess so it was kind of really then that that I started thinking that I had to do stuff that was more project based or that was more a series of photographs than mm. just a singular you know, shot or a singular idea. Did you, uh, what, what, what predicated the move out of Sydney? I felt like it, well, I mean, I pretty much got to the the top of the pile, I mean, without being arrogant, but I mean, I just pretty much shot for every major agency and most, you know, won heaps of international awards and, you know, I was the sort of youngest photographer ever to work, win a Cannes Grand Prix at the age of 24. Four or five or whatever what was it was, that for? and that was for the Cadu show. Oh, Cadu, Paul yeah, yeah, Paul, yeah, exactly. Ben yeah, yeah. yeah Paul and Ben. Um, and you know, so I, I kind of felt I'd just gone as far as I could go, and I was on a shoot in LA, and I flew to New York. Well, actually, the producer introduced me to uh, a guy who became my first agent, and who I've just gone back to is a guy called Michael Ash, mm. um, who I absolutely adore. He's such a fantastic agent. 
and Michael had seen a lot of my work in Archive magazine and stuff, and he was like, I want to represent you, and you know, and it just, there were a lot of different things going on in my life at that time, and it just made sense, really, just to... to was know, it an ambition thing life. as well, to crack America? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I guess there was probably a bit of ego there as well, right. but I mean, it was also, I mean, I, I kind of just felt that being in Sydney, uh, that there was just nowhere left for me to go. How many years did you do there? Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Okay. And then was um, when you came out to come over here, did you have to kind of prove yourself all over again? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was funny because I sort of came out here. I was like, hey, you know, I've won a <laughs> DNOD, I've won Khan, I've done, you know, I've got like one shows and London internationals and it means it's nothing. Out. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> they look at it, you go, what? It's yeah. like, you know, I mean, basically everything you've done prior to coming to New York, it's just forget about it. So I think that <clears throat> that was when, I mean, it was, I mean, one of the also, also another one of the reasons was that, you know, I was working so much in Sydney, like to make ends meet. And, you know, there, there becomes a level in a company where the amount of staff that you have negates the profit you make. And, you, yes. you know, there's a, a you know, there's ratio a ratio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I was so busy that the amount of staff I had to put on, you know, it was basically, it was, I would have been better off doing less work and having less staff. And, mm. How many staff you, did you have at the top of your... Ah, uh, in Sydney, three full-timers and three freelancers, right. just for me. I Seriously, I mean, I'd be working 14 hour days, seven days a week, and, and a lot of it was just churn and burn stuff. A lot of it was just, you know... And, you did know, you ever get sick of it? Yeah, I think, well, that's, that's really what happened. It was, really? I just got sick of doing that. And I knew that I, that I was getting a to machine. a stage where I was risking quality. Right. And it became bad quantity. And it wasn't something I wanted to do. And also, at the time, I, I knew that if I was doing half the work in America, I'd probably be earning twice the amount of money. Mm. So, yeah, I just kind of felt it was really time to make a move. And it wasn't the most ideal time to make a move because my son had just been born. So it meant... You know, but my marriage had broken up, so it meant, you know, sort of leaving him and spending time in, in America, and you know. But I always was like, okay, well, my commitment to that is I'll be back in Sydney for every school holiday. So mm-hmm. that was that was the deal. So, so I moved over to New York in ninety ninety seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, it was tough. It was yeah, yeah it was <laughs> like I, I landed and expected to work straight away. And I'd already done a couple of jobs. Michael had already got a couple of jobs that I'd flown over for. But I had a lot of time on my hands. So did you close your shop in Sydney? Yeah, show everything down. And so you're suddenly back on your own. Yeah. Did, did you have to find a studio or what? Yeah, well, actually, I lived in the Chelsea Hotel when I first moved there. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so I'd spent three months there. Which was did you take any that was pictures of the inmates? Yeah, I've, I've got some. I've got some snaps from around that time. Yeah, that was an interesting experience to say the least. And I, yeah, I mean, I had so much time on my hands that I'd pack a camera bag and I'd, you know, leave the apartment with the camera on my shoulder, and but I wouldn't get the camera bag out. I'd just walk around, and I was, and I, I realised that I'd just forgotten how to take pictures for myself because I didn't have a brief. I was so used to working to a brief that I just didn't have an idea in my head, you know, and so I started briefing myself and I worked on... So the artist had got disappeared and the you become like a machine. Yeah, pretty to get much, back into, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't realise... Was it scary for how, you? Yeah, it was, very, yeah, very, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realise the extent of what, of, of how much I'd sort of kicked the artist out of me by just consuming myself with commercial work really which yeah which was really yeah big eye opener mm. like a really big eye opener and then how did you get so you were briefing giving yourself little projects did it just start to come back naturally or yeah just yeah I mean one thing leads to another I mean I, th- I, th- I think that's the thing I mean even now it's, it's some of the stuff you've done just to maybe segue I, I mean I love the the football yeah, the beautiful game. Well, beautiful game. I mean, it's funny. Tell me how that would have started. So basically, that t- tell me what it is. I knew I always wanted to do a football-related project. I wanted to combine my my sort of kind of two loves, which are you know photography and and football. I used to go and watch my son train. So every school holiday, I'd go back and my son play football from a, from the age of five. And there were these old broken goalposts which were sitting next to this sort of kind of stack of pine trees or this sort of mini pine forest. And I took this picture and I, I looked at it at the time, I was just like, yeah, it's fantastic, but I didn't really know what to do with it. And then 
so then I had I had this sort of kind of idea about you know lone goalposts in the middle of fields and just you know what the game really is you know mm. I mean you know what football's become in the Premier League and you know what people see on TV is not necessarily no. what the roots mm. of football is you know and a lot of the professional grounds were built for communities you mm. know and the communities are very much part of the club and the club's very much part of the community mm. You know, some of the grounds are built in very sort Centre of, of town. Yeah, like you know, the terraced Belton areas. I mean, you, yeah, exactly. Like, like, like Anfield or yeah. you know, um, Goodison, yeah. Goodison Park. You know, for me, I mean, I'm an atheist, so you know, for me, it's my religion. Bill Shankly, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's almost sort of kind of like you know, when a Christian sees a cross, it's like yeah. when I see a goalpost yeah, or yeah, a, yeah. or a stadium. And then I love the idea of that the, these stadiums are just sort of kind of redundant during the week. You know, I mean, unless you've got a Champions League game or a midweek game but they're these buildings which just sort of kind of come alive on, ma- on match day and there's something that's just so special about match yeah. day you know I yeah. remember you know like being going to football with my mates was really the first time I felt part of something you know it was mm. just you know there's, yeah, a, there's an identity that, that you have and there's very much a growing experience it's funny actually because I've just done a one of the projects I'm finishing now is is called GBH, which is um, uh, Great Britain's hooligans. Oh, yeah. Um, so I photographed some of the ex, sort of kind of top guys. From, Where are they now? For, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> well, how, how they've sort of turned their life around, really, yeah. more than anything. You were saying to me quite a lot of them have, yeah? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Because it was yeah. pretty savage back then. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah in yeah. the 80s. Yeah, it was full on. So. And the other thing about these goalposts, so they're basically a whole series of. Goal well, posts, they're right? just—they're not sort of goalposts. I mean, basically, what I do now is like anywhere I go in the world, I just find a football ground to go and photograph it, and it's all the way through from grass, grassroots to the premium stadium, stadiums, you know, like yeah. Anfield and Old Trafford, and you know, and I photograph actually I photograph Stamford Bridge from West Brompton Cemetery, and that was two days after we won the Champions League. You know, that had been a trophy that we'd been chasing for so mm. long and, you know, we'd laid a lot of ghosts to rest that night. Yeah. So I photographed it from West Brompton Center. She says, obviously, my favourite picture. <laughs> you also did a lovely one of, uh, what was it, Daily Mount in Dublin? Daily Mount. Yeah, I love Daily Mount. It's funny, actually, I was there. Daily Mount is a really old, like what we were talking about, a really old classic stadium falling apart now in the middle of Dublin. It used yeah. to... It used to host the occasional Irish soccer match, but a really intimate little proper old yeah. down a laneway kind of. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, over the Bohemians, right? Mm. Yeah. But one of the pictures I have of Daly Mount is there's a church in the background yeah. as well. One of the things that I've I've realised a lot of the grounds in England and Scotland, there's always a church somewhere. Yeah, you go and pray. And for there's, a win. There's, there's there's this beautiful contrast between you know the church, the two and, religions. Yeah, exactly. So you were in Ireland that time to for for one of sort of a bit of a sad and poignant but beautifully rendered you were the last guy to photograph Seamus Heaney the very famous yeah, Irish yeah, poet yeah. that was an amazing experience actually it's funny because I'd met I met Seamus at the Griffith Poetry Prize were he and your father in touch yeah well he was yeah he, like him and my, my father and Seamus knew each other right. um, you know from sort of kind of around the traps obviously both being poets and what have you and Seamus was getting the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Griffith Poetry Prize and my father actually won the International Prize so they do three prizes they do the International Poetry Prize mm. they do a Canadian Prize and then they do a Lifetime Achievement Award and Seamus won that and I, I got introduced to him I flew up to, to Toronto just to be with my father because it kind of, my, my dad for a while we used to get nominated for every single award but never win anything right. I was kind of like and I, I just figured you know fuck if he doesn't win this one I've just got to be there for him just so I could take him out and get him drunk yeah. <laughs> here we go again yeah but anyway he won it which was fantastic and I met Seamus and and Seamus and I just got on really well he's such a gentle you know, you know, such a gentleman like in the in all senses of the word mm. it really is just was a beautiful man during it, I said to him, I, I said, look, you know, if I get myself to Dublin, I said, you know, will you sit for me? Will you do... I, I, I don't know why, but I just sort of kind of felt it was a really important portrait for me. I mean, I th- knowing how much my father admired him mm-hmm. and, you know, probably the greatest poet of his generation, really. Yes. And so anyway, we, we had a bit of back and forth on email with his wife, Murray, trying to organise a date, and it kept falling through. And, and I was in Australia on a on a shoot, and this was just before Easter and 
and I teed up to go to England for Easter and then I was going to hop over to, to um, Dublin to photograph Shavers just before Easter. Then I had this job come in and it would, would have kept me in Australia and meant I would have had to cancel again. And I'd, I'd already cancelled once, Seamus had cancelled once and, and I was just like, I can't, like, I can't cancel this again. Something just said, oh, yeah. you've got to go do this now. So crazy as it was, you know, I flew all the way to England, spent a day in England, jumped on a plane, went to Dublin, met up with Seamus and, and just had a wonderful, wonderful sort of kind of four hours with him at his house shooting his portrait and he a captured a couple of cheeky whiskies as well yeah. <laughs> so he captured a, a sadness yeah in him that yeah. Uh, was it's quite it's quite haunting actually when you, yeah you can see your work on simonharson.com yeah Simon yeah, yeah, Harson. you, I think that, yeah. that those photographs of Seamus Heaney are on there and they're yeah. worth a they're worth a look but no one, I mean, no one knew that, you know, literally sort of kind of three months later he passed away, unfortunately. Yeah. And it was, I sent him copies of the print, I think in the May, and I'd been away on location. I got back to New York and there was a letter waiting for me. And I have, a, I have the, this, only three things I have in my safe at home, which is my passport, my birth certificate, and this letter from Seamus Heaney really? that he hand wrote me just telling me how beautiful he thought the photographs yeah. were and you know how much he admired the process and and how he knew how difficult it was for every, for all the stars to align and uh, it's yeah it's it, I mean without doubt it's it's my most treasured um, possession in, in the in, in you know much more over any of the awards that mm. I've ever won from photography just you know having yeah and I think you know it's, it's, it's you really captured it. I, it was one of the first times that I'd seen I know a little bit about him fancy myself as a bit of a bad poet but you know it's like when you see him you kind of go wow oh, that really you know, it's, it's haunting yeah. so um, the other one I wanted to talk about was the icebergs how did that yeah. come about well the icebergs I mean as I, as I was saying earlier that I mean the icebergs really was born out of the up, my upbringing yeah. So it was. You still have your Titanic picture? No, somewhere. I don't. I wish I did. I wish I did. I really wish I did. Actually, I got. A cu- it's funny actually. Got like I said earlier. I went back. Mum had a big clear out, and there's a couple of paintings there from when I was a, you know, twelve year old. And I was looking at them going, "Oh my god, I'm so glad I found photography." <laughs> <laughs> So you went and photographed. How many icebergs? Did you, well, you did a portrait of icebergs. Well, what happened? What happened I'm was at one I was now, on your wall. yeah. What, what happened was I was in Thailand on a shoot, and, and I was shooting for Mercedes again, car. So you know, we finished the shoot. We'd been out out in the field all day, and I got back to the hotel and you know ran myself a bath, and you know the bath was the size of my apartment in yeah. New York. You yeah. know? So I'm sort of kind of sitting in this bath, going you know with a beer and. Room service and just and yeah, and yeah, just so going, totally. how the fuck did I get here? You know, mm. yeah, this kid from Aylesbury with nothing and Tim Bath and all that sort of stuff. And you know, at the time, I was sort of kind of really keen to do something a personal project, but like a a, a personal project deeply rooted in one of the things that really uh, intrigues me and I guess shows up in a lot of my work is is the paths that we choose and the decisions that we make and where that then leads us. Mm. And I was, you know, I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, how do I get here? And it was kind of like, really, it just sort of kind of boiled down to, you know, everything changed when I did that picture of the Titanic, like the, the painting. When I was 12, that's what led me to painting and then led me to photography. And, mm. you know, so it was the catalyst to change a life, if you like. Mm. So I started doing research on the Titanic and I thought that that might be, you know, given it was built in Belfast, launched from uh, England to New York, I thought that that might be the story. So it might be interesting to explore the Titanic because that was about a journey and oh, know, studied the painting well. and stuff like that. Something draws you to it. Yeah, I mean, I just, it's, it's just, and it's kind of one of those sort of really mysterious stories, you know, and I think that you found out that there was this place called Iceberg Alley, which um, mm. immediately uh, 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 sort of kind of appealed to my bizarre sense of humour. I, I had this vision of like, Iceberg standing in an alley. Yeah, with yeah, flick yeah, knives. Yeah, flick knives <laughs> and clubbing <laughs> ships in the night. You know. So that was sort of kind of one thing that really drew me to that. But also, I think one the biggest thing was the fact that 
the iceberg would have had would have broken off of the the glacier in Uliasat and travelled all the way down. It would have had broken off the glacier a year before the Titanic had even been finished being built. Yeah. And so you know there was this this iceberg that was always Destined. on this course. It was this destiny involved yeah. and stuff. And then just the you know the fact that icebergs are, are you know born and then they snap off the glacier and you know get battened beaten and then get absorbed back into the water it's this this yeah. kind of life cycle if you like yeah. with with the water um that really intrigued me and so that's when i just went okay well the, the icebergs are the metaphor for my own journey and they're the metaphor for you were rounding a, a circle cap- yeah i mean it's, it's that sort of you know every weather storm every weather pattern every current that happened Mm. for that iceberg put that on a collision yeah, course so there were daily changes that which I love that I love that yeah weird, exactly yeah. exactly it's butterfly effect so I went to I went to New Finland first and I photographed off the coast of St. John's which is really where the icebergs dissipate and yeah. that's where they sort of kind of end up and so I went there and I spent 10 days on the water there photographing icebergs there and I remember giggling like a child when I saw my first iceberg it was yeah. just it was it was sort of kind of real I had a very strong vision about how I wanted to present these icebergs I wanted to present them in a which is one of the reasons why it's called male portrait of an iceberg in a in a way that they were almost statuesque they were almost yeah. like portraits so I spent a lot of time looking at uh, Mark Rothko paintings before I went out and did the project and just his use of colour and division of block colours and just how they relate. So I pretty much had a very stringent point of view of how I was mm. going to photograph this. So it would be sea, iceberg, sky. That was always a very shining You capture a area. menace about them. They're yeah. Almost, they're, they're almost personified as like, when you think about that iceberg alley, it's like, I don't want to meet that iceberg. Yeah, territory. historically. <laughs> exactly. I know. I mean, the one you're looking at now is, is, the one, is one of the ones shot in the mist. And, it, you know, I mean, there's just... I got gifted so many shots on this yeah. and you know really like you know great photography is just about turning up um, and this this was a, f- a really foggy day and we woke up and the guy uh, I stayed at this dive lodge and we'd hook up this trailer a rib boat to this this trailer um, Zodiac you know um, mm. we'd hook it up to his trailer and we'd go and find icebergs and then drop the boat in the water and go off and he, we woke up this morning it was really foggy and he says oh, I guess you don't want to go out today I was like no I definitely want to Today's go out today. Day. Today's the day. Yeah. It's like you know, last thing I want is sunny weather. I don't do. I'm, you know, I'm dark. Yeah. I don't. I don't do sunny weather very well. That's a good way to <clears throat> maybe conclude. Just coming full circle with the icebergs. The, yeah. the one thing I would ask though is, what, what would you say to a kid like you in Aylesbury or somewhere else in the world who's trying to think about maybe doing a career? And what, what have you learned? What are your pearls? Of wisdom? You know. You know what? I mean, I just just be a sponge. Like really, just be a sponge, just absorb so much. Don't you know? Don't use it to to plagiarize. But I mean, it's the same thing as what I say to my son. It's like you know, if you feed your body full of hamburgers, you're gonna get fat and lazy, right? Yeah. It's like if you you know, it's, it's the same with your mind. Like if you if you sit down and just watch junk on TV or just fuel your brain with stuff that 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 drives a passion and that inspires you and that and and you know, things will find you once you do that. One thing always leads to another. You know, you discover one painter. And you know, I, I love painting. I mean, I still I use still use painting as a lot of inspiration, much more so than photography. You I mean, still I paint a painting? Uh, yeah, every now and again. Right. But yeah, no one will ever see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's purely just for me. And yeah, I don't. I actually would like to do it a lot more, but it's tough finding time to do all I have to do anyway at the moment. Without. Listen, thanks a lot for the My chat. Pleasure, it was man. really good. Yeah, um, yeah cool. Another Anytime. pint with Shawnee B ends this time with Simon Harson. We might actually go for a real pint now in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish you all the best in uh, whatever the next endeavours are. Thanks, man. And you're, 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 you're really inspires me. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Cheers. Pleasure.